ਹੈ ਚੀਫ ਮਾਰਸ਼ਲ ਤਿਆਗੀ ਹੈ ਚੀਫ ਮਾਰਸ਼ਲ ਬਦੂਰੀਆ ਐ ਮਾਰਸ਼ਲ ਏਪੀ ਸਿੰਘ ਵਾਈਸ ਚੀਫ ਆਫ ਐਸ ਸਟਾਫ ਅ ਵੈਰੀ ਵਾਰਮ ਵੈਲਕਮ ਟੂ ਆਲ ਆਫ ਯੂ ਔਨ ਥਿਸ ਸੈਮੀਨਲ ਇਵੈਂਟ ਥੈਟ ਕੈਪਸ ਕੰਡਕਟਸ ਅਲੋਂਗ ਵਿਦ ਆਈ ਐਮ ਆਰ ਔਨ ਏਅਰ ਐਂਡ ਮਿਸਾਈਲ ਡਿਫੈਂਸ and uh, uh, we'll kick start the proceedings uh, this morning by you know i'll just give you a brief outlook as to how the future battle space is going to be highly uh, uh, not only highly contested but anti access and uh, area denial environment that is going to prevail like we are seeing in the uh, russia ukraine conflict and uh, as technology advances you find that new uh, hazards continue to arise on the battlefield which uh, is in perpetual evolution unmanned aerial vehicles including autonomous loitering munitions hypersonic weapons stealth aircraft directed energy weapons combined with cyber attacks on air defense systems electronic warfare and the use of space based weapons uh, satellites missiles uh, these are some of the threats that are emerging and uh, are in the process of you know maturing on the battlefield now if you look at our uh, uh, primary adversary uh, the threat posed by uh, plaf has actually substantially transformed over the last uh, few decades and uh, they have evolved themselves into a more uh, modern and capable entity uh, with uh, modern aircraft and uh, armaments and systems with with enhanced capabilities to operate in a network centric uh, environment and also along with their space based uh, sh china is one of the largest uh, uh, you know launch of satellites only just behind the united states the introduction of stealth uh, technology advanced avionics advanced engines and in the and an increase in the number and types of aircraft uh, their ranges and training have actually resulted in a significant modernization of their uh, air force and this is not only facilitated projection of power by plaf uh, across the region but also made them uh, compatible with you know network centric uh, environment and capabilities uh, which actually make uh, uh, their platforms and their weapon systems much more potent in today's environment uh, when we look at uh, ukraine uh, the ongoing uh, conflict reminds us uh, of the intense competition that will occur over air dominance in the tactical battle space uh, surface to air missiles which encompass gun based and anti aircraft ordnance and man pads are essential to forces worldwide and this has been reiterated in this conflict in the future the blend in the v shorad shorad that is a very short range and potentially in the short range air defense systems may be supplemented actually by directed energy weapons such as lasers and it is and in addition to surface to surface and air to surface missiles ground forces uh, face many aerial threats including piloted fixed wing rotary wing aircraft unmanned aerial vehicles swarm drones and others and additionally uh, the modern uh, uh, counter rocket artillery uh, 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 motor system that is cram systems for actually function as a very effective uh, vishorat Optics and radars are the primary tools that Chorat forces employ to detect, identify, monitor and assist in engaging aerial threats and networking Chorat presents its own uh, set of obstacles. Uh, actually a weave Chorat uh, radar must uh, detect and monitor a diverse array of targets at appropriate ranges to provide uh, short range air defense units at the tactical edge with sufficient time to engage them. air to air uh, combat uh, uh, when you look at that the advances in weapon sensor and communication technologies uh, have actually altered the fundamental nature of air combat character of air combat and in the present day uh, it uh, may be advisable to adopt a broader perspective when uh, developing future air combat operational concepts sensors weapons and platforms and this would entail the examination of radical deviations from conventional fighter concepts that rely on enhanced sensor performance signature control networks to achieve superior uh, situational awareness and very long range weapons to actually complete complete engagements even before uh, being detected or tracked by the enemy aircraft uh, if you look at trends in uh, weapon uh, weapon delivery today's air forces possess a diverse array of aerial delivery armaments that uh, can be employed in various missions and scenarios uh, precision guided munitions smart bombs cluster bombs glide bombs standoff missiles cruise missiles and 
autonomous uh, uh, unmanned UAVs are among the most recent types of air delivery systems with hard kill options of the UAVs. When, when we look at air uh, defense radar trends, uh, radars which are a critical and indispensable component of the uh, air defense inventory have significantly enhanced their capabilities and these enhancement capabilities include extended detection ranges, multi-mode uh, operations that is search, track and fire control simultaneously while tracking many uh, multiple targets, uh, including low observable target detection, built-in electronic uh, uh, counter countermeasures and network-centric operation with the other systems. Uh, the most recent radars can generate high-resolution 3D images of the airspace, which offer more precise and detailed information regarding the location and movement of airborne targets. Their performance has been enhanced and they have adapted to new and emergent hazards due to artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, Ground-based uh, air defense weapon systems aim to engage aircraft, missiles, and other airborne threats at lower altitudes and shorter ranges than Air Force weapons. They frequently uh, consist of Shorides and SAMs, as I have spoken about earlier. And uh, actually, if you look at Air Force uh, weapons, uh, they are generally intended to engage and annihilate adversary aircraft at greater altitudes and longer distances. And they consist of bombers, fighter aircraft, air to air and air to ground missiles, uh, with the, the objective being to assassinate adversary uh, uh, air bases and other strategic targets and establish air uh, superiority. Also, they are equipped with radars to facilitate target uh, acquisition and early warning. In contemporary warfare, ground-based air defense weapons are closely integrated with air force weapons and other air defense systems, and this is an, an essential requirement. Uh, you know, to establish a layered air defense system and enhance the overall efficiencies of the air defense uh, uh, system. And historically, uh, if you look at the Air Force, it has been tasked with defending the nation's airspace and uh, executing offensive operations against hostile aircraft and other airborne threats. And therefore, the Air Force emphasizes frequently on air defense operations and actually possess, uh, possesses the requisite expertise, training, and experience to manage and supervise air defense uh, assets effectively. Implementing this air defense system can be a, a complex task due to various factors such as our country's geographical location and terrain, the complexity of components and subsystems, the country's limited resources, and integration with other military and aviation systems, that is the other services as well as the civil systems, and uh, also protecting the infrastructure against cyber and electronic warfare, interoperability, and training. And to discuss all these uh, and uh, more issues in the air defense, uh, Ryan, we, we've got a full day session and uh, we've got uh, experts uh, from various fields in the air defense, both from the uh, Air Force, the Navy, and the Army. And uh, uh, we hope to have a very productive uh, discussion and engagement today. Uh, throughout the day, which, I mean, it will carry on with one session prior to lunch and two more sessions uh, uh, post-lunch. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir. Our chief guest, Air Marshal A.P. Singh, PVSM, AVSM, Vice Chief of Air Staff, was commissioned as a fighter pilot in the Indian Air Force in 1984. He is an alumnus of National Defense Academy, Defense Services Staff College, and National Defense College. He has flown a variety of fighter and trainer aircraft with more than 4,900 hours of operational flying. He is a qualified flying instructor. He commanded the 22 Squadron hosting the MiG-27. He spearheaded the MiG-29 Upgrade Project Management Team at Moscow, Russia, and was instrumental in flight testing of HAL Tejas. He served as the chief test pilot at Aircraft and Systems Testing Establishment and as the project director at National Flight Test Center Aeronautical Development Agency. As Air Vice Marshal, he served as, as the Air Defense Commander of Southwestern Air Command. He was the Senior Air Staff Officer, Eastern Air Command, and AOC in C, Central Air Command, before he assumed the appointment of Vice Chief of Air Staff. May I now invite the Air Marshal to deliver the inaugural address.
thank you, Ms. Radhe, for that uh, very elaborate introduction. Former chiefs, uh, DG Caps, all uh, senior officers from various uh, services and departments in uh, industry. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, Chopi sir must say that the handing over, taking over of caps has been absolutely seamless. Because the last time I came here and I realized, what do I say after the introductory you know, uh, talk by Chopi sir and today I'm in the same state. Uh, Golu sir has already you know, covered the topic in a very uh, uh, concise manner and covering almost every aspect of uh, the things that we are going to discuss today. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Marshal Golani, for uh, you know, giving me this opportunity. This, is, uh, uh, this topic, air and missile defense, is a very relevant and uh, in today's environment becomes more relevant when we have this uh, plethora of uh, threats that we see emanating and they are growing every day. I also must comment on the journey of CAPS from 2001, very humble beginnings. It has come a long way and we have, you know, almost uh, every strategic concerning, uh, any, every topic concerning the strategy or uh, air domain and nuclear domain being discussed very often and uh, a lot of good uh, lessons that are learned. I just hope that uh, we all keep pace with it and also keep imbibing those lessons that we learn here. He has very uh, succinctly brought out the, the environmental scan of today and uh, also about, talked about the contested airspace that we are going to be operating in. He has also covered certain takeaways from these ongoing uh, uh, conflicts that we have. So one thing is very clear that in, if we need to do something, if we need to stay uh, in the game, we need to modernize, we need to continue growing, we need to continue innovating, and we need to continue uh, being ahead of the curve. Otherwise, you lag behind, and then you are just chasing. Technological advancements, you know, the rapid pace at which we are seeing in our normal life, have also infused themselves into our uh, you know, weaponry, into our defense uh, systems, Today, you know, what was uh, unthinkable or unimaginable a uh, few years back is a reality today. And uh, its impact on the defense forces, on the war fighting has uh, made it clear that we need to be agile and flexible in our thoughts as well as actions. The ongoing conflicts that he alluded about, uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, the and, uh, you know, multi-domain uh, battle space, the much talked about uh, A2 AD environment. It's a classic example of what is going on today and what we are, uh, you know, uh, likely to face in our future conflicts. You know, it is also, uh, this conflict has also demonstrated integration of uh, multiple forces in domains of air, land, sea, cyber, information, space, and how they are united to achieve the goal. I'm sure everyone who's present here, including uh, my friends from the other services, will agree that uh, the air domain has clearly emerged as a singular trans-domain link and a strong force across domain, uh, uh, you know, for uh, a strong uh, method Cross, uh, for cross-domain uh, uh, cross application of force. And uh, it is not just an enabler, it has become a force multiplier. Even in the urban warfare uh, uh, construct that we see in Arab, Israel, uh, sorry, the Israel-Hamas war, uh, the air domain has been used extensively, whether it is uh, utilizing those fighter aircraft with precision weapons or it is the formidable iron dome system or, you know, uh, utilizing of those low-cost rockets and uh, uh, loiter munitions by Hamas in uh, challenging that very formidable, very costly system itself. 
while the four basic uh, uh, requirements of air defense or tenets of air defense remain the same, that is uh, early warning and detection, uh, secure and redundant uh, communication, the command and control, and thereafter weapon system to take on your threat. However, uh, with the complexities and the scales that have gone up, these systems also need to be uh, more and more complex, more and more redundant, and uh, be able to take on the uh, large data that they will have. Our uh, detection system has to cater for uh, big aircraft, normal fighter aircraft, to the stealth technology, to the very small uh, the drones, slow-moving small drones, and also to hypersonic missiles. And uh, this will require a multitude of sensors, uh, sensors which can you know, fill the gaps that exist in today's uh, single uh, objective sensor, I can say. And like he has alluded, that it will have all kinds of RF, uh, uh, IR spectrum, uh, the uh, EO spectrum, everything getting uh, acoustic radars, everything getting filled up. And we need to develop these and deploy these in various layers so that we can take on an, an, uh, a third, uh, a take on a threat in time to be able to uh, neutralize it before it actually does any damage. Communication, yes, whatever information we gather, whatever data we gather has to be communicated in a very uh, secure manner and in a redundant manner to the decision maker. So there is no doubt that uh, this becomes a very important part. However, with the kind of technology that has come in, our uh, uh, network systems are under threat. We need to build uh, them more robust as well as have multiple layers, multiple uh, backups available, whether it is terrestrial, whether it is radio, whether it is uh, SATCOM. We need to build them all to keep our uh, communication system robust and secure. Uh, robust command and control, you know, all this information that is available has to be processed in time to be able to take decisions. So this data, this information uh, needs, uh, uh, it's possible today to have this data fused, to have this whole information processed in quick time by the use of new technologies of uh, machine learning and AI that he spoke about and give us give the decision maker, give the commander who is sitting in that underground uh, uh, bunker or underground uh, uh, ops room, the, give him the options or give him the best option that he has so that he can take his call quickly. And of course, the weapon systems to take care of all the multitude of threats that I talked about, whether it is a fighter aircraft, high speed uh, missiles, the hypersonics, whether it's low speed, low RCS drones, everything has to be engaged and we have to once again have a multitude of uh, uh, weapon systems from, right from fighter aircraft, long range SAMs to SHORADs and uh, close-in weapon systems that he talked about. We all understand that uh, we as a nation face a large number of challenges today. The, uh, you know, uh, it's right from, uh, like I already just said, it is from the conventional, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, conventional challenges which are also increasingly becoming more and more aggressive and also an orthodox application of uh, uh, force in the air domain with using this subconventional uh, uh, weapons that we so spoke about. So it's in this highly dense battle space, uh, we, we need to put in place plans to have optimal utilization of whatever resources we have. And at the same time, optimal and also innovative utilization. And at the same time, we need to make sure that we are uh, innovating, we are uh, improving our systems by also by going through upgrades or by going through procurements, uh, whatever is possible. We are uh, uh, you know, putting things in place so that we understand where we are going and whether we are able to match the challenges that are in the future. 
if uh, geo geopolitics uh, is the, the biggest lesson that we have learned from today's geopolitics is to be self-reliant. Like they say, there is no permanent uh, enemy or permanent friend. We, they all have permanent interests. So, Aat Nirbharta that we've been talking about, Aat Nirbhar Bharat that we've been talking about, is not just a buzzword. It is something that we need to, uh, you know, put our heart and soul into and make sure that these technologies that we are talking about, the weapons that we are talking about of the future, are all developed and manufactured in India so that we are not relying on an outside agency who could change its alliance, who could uh, you know, stop the flow of uh, uh, these weapons to our country and put us on the mat when the time comes. We have engaged, as Indian Air Force, we have engaged with the DRDO, private industry, to bolster our capabilities in radars, SAGW, counter US systems, and a plethora of other things, communications, command and control. We already have a very uh, robust uh, and uh, impetus is being given to the new technologies in the field of directed energy and uh, close-in weapon systems, modernizing our aerial platforms, modernizing our surface-to-air weapon systems. And uh, we have, uh, at the moment, ongoing contracts of almost 115 crores, uh, 1,000 crores uh, in the air defense itself, you know, things concerning air defense. And uh, if you look at the plans that are there in the pipeline, it is another 250 to 270 thousand crores worth of contracts that are waiting. So, uh, like I said, Aat uh, Mirbharta is what we are riding on. And uh, all these contracts that I'm talking about, majority of them, majority of them are with the Indian uh, partners, Indian industry. But uh, this Aat Mirbharta cannot be at the cost of nation's defense. Nation's defense comes first and foremost. And if Indian Air Force or Indian forces have to ride on this Atmanir Bharata, it is only possible if everyone, you know, from uh, DRDO to DPSUs to the private industry, holds our hand and take us to that, on that path. And don't let us deviate from that path. Because when it comes to national defense, there will be compulsions to deviate from that path in case we do not get the things that we need or the, the kind of uh, systems and weaponry that is required to survive in today's world. So my uh, humble request to each one of us here, including, you know, uh, we in uniform, that let's, uh, you know, find a system, uh, put a system in place where we are helping each other out in achieving the overall goal, which are our goals. It is not anybody else's, it's not yours or mine. These goals have to be treated like our goals. If we have to defend the nation, it is everybody's job. It is not just the job of a person in uniform. So if, whether you are in uh, DRDO, doing the, you know, uh, innovative technologies or uh, innovative uh, uh, solutions that you are thinking of conceiving, or you are in uh, uh, defense PSUs or private industry who are uh, implementing those uh, innovative uh, technologies or solutions in the form of a product, we all have to work in unison. We all have to work at a much, much faster pace. The rate at which we are getting our equipment at the moment is too low. And if we don't increase that rate, so along with the, you know, these uh, R&D agencies who are looking at new technologies and new uh, systems to develop, the industry has to be ready to absorb the technology. Industry has to build their capability and capacity both, so that when we look at our uh, adversaries, the rate at which they are growing, the rate at which they are imbibing these technologies and still growing in numbers, we have a long gap to catch up with, and this gap is widening further. So this is something that we need to look at as a whole.
nation as a whole and we need to find a solution to this gap that is building. Another thing that I wanted to inform the house was that keeping an eye on the future, we have uh, operationalized the dedicated uh, weapon system branch in the Indian Air Force and uh, a sub-branch of this is going to be uh, dedicatedly responsible for surface to air guided weapons. So this will give another impetus to the, the very topic that we have today, the air defense part. So uh, I'm not going to take much time of yours. You know, I know there is a plethora of uh, knowledge to be learned today. All I want to say is, uh, you know, getting everybody together, the, the DRDO, the R&D agencies, uh, the uh, production agencies, that is the DPSU and the industry, the academia, the people and users like me, together on a platform. I think CAPS has done a wonderful thing and uh, I'm sure when we discuss today, a number of lessons will come out. Let's capture, you know, some two or three good lessons out of it and uh, then make sure that we pursue those till they are fructifying. My compliments once again to CAPS for arranging this and uh, I wish all the very best to everyone who's going to speak today and discuss today. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Being in the Air Force Auditorium, I thought I should invoke the presence of Lord Krishna here. Navam sparsham deeptam anekavarnam vyaptananam deepta vishalanetram drishtvahitvam pravyatita antaratma drutim navindami shamam chavishno. Drutim navindami shamam chavishno. There is no peace. There is no firmness. I am on a shaky foot. Why? Because the Air Force adopts, Indian Air Force adopts the, the motto from here, Nabam Sparsham Deeptam, touching the sky with glory. Touching the sky effluent with glory. So ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, we are here. A respected Vice Chief of the Air Staff, respected Air Marshal, former Chiefs, senior officers from the Indian Air Force, from uh, the other arms and services, veterans, ladies and gentlemen. I want to begin with what the Israel Missile Defense Chief said very recently. Layered systems approach has proven its value amid the Gaza conflict. Years of training, testing, joint exercises with the US helped Israel prepare its defenses for threats it faced over the last nine months. Not only relative short strikes from Hamas in Gaza, but long-range drone and missile attacks from the Houthis in Yemen and from Iran, according to many of the Israeli officials as well as the missile chief. The Russian army losses in Ukraine exceeded 560,000 troops in terms of um, 560,000 troops. Um, a number of uh, forces that have been destroyed, about 8,000 Russian tanks, 15,000 armor fighting vehicles, more than 1,000 um, um, rocket launchers, 892 anti-aircraft warfare systems, cruise missiles, 361 warplanes, 326 helicopters, and the number is just counting. Since we talked about the conflict, I wanted to draw a few of the headlines that uh, we have been following. I have about 500 of them. I'm going to recount only a few of them just to highlight the importance of um, air and missile defense. Ukraine army of drones unveils EPFS armor piercing ammunition for the FPV drones, the first, uh, uh, the first, first point of view. Ukraine forces capture suicide drones, modular technology, low cost and effective that they were. Russia deploys new mobile anti-drone units with uh, Zu-23 cannons. Ukraine wants interceptor drones to hunt and take out unmanned surveillance aircraft. Russian um, Su-34 bomber targets Ukrainian positions and with thermobaric bombs. 
Russian Ministry of Defense have used innovative drone warfare tactics. The first person viewed drones with a warhead of uh, RPG-7 type of rocket is one of them. Ukraine drones destroy six fighter jets in the Morozov Air Force Base in Rostov region. So, and there are so many. And I, I just want, I, I can go on and on and, uh, you know, we have been talking about um, uh, the increase strikes with drones like landslits, massive drone, drone attack by Ukraine in Crimea. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed with the Houthis many times because uh, it is the fifth, uh, fifth time that they brought down the, uh, the MQ-9 and uh, they are consistently doing it in spite of heavy deployment over there. Um, a U.S. Navy EA-18G Grawler electronic warfare jet claimed the type of its first air-to-air -air kill, likely a Houthi drone. And as recently as in, in April, um, Israel claimed that 99% of more than, the, more than 300 missiles and drones launched by Iran um, were, were intercepted by their Iron Dome, arrow interceptors, etc. So the question comes, there is an asymmetry. The question comes, we're going to talk about it in the end again. The question comes, is warfare cheap? Is warfare costly? And uh, how do you balance this? Defense is always costly, attack is always cheap. So we have to think in terms of, um, of, of developing an asymmetric warfare in terms of creating cheap weapons which will be able to be cost effective and also battle effective. So some of the major highlights are uh, air defense by drones. It all comes down to the law of probability and when you go into the mathematical domain of, uh, of probability and CS2, how many rounds do you fire from the ground in terms of air defense in order to make a hit and, uh, and, and what causes the, the increase in the, in the degree of, in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the probability that you would hit. So then we come to things like uh, ahead ammunition. And uh, ahead ammunition, as all of you are already aware, a cone-type discharge, uh, about 152-odd tungsten-based projectiles, which can be thrown, and Ellicon has done a great job at that. Um, India is also looking at something like that. I think we withdrew the 220 AD guns and it's back again. I don't know what's going to happen with that, that program. But there we are, we are looking at, at ammunition with very close to what, uh, what we have been seeing and probably better. Then we talk of hunter drones, we talk of FPV drones, and then South Korea has just launched what is called as a star war weapons uh, to defeat North Korea. And Hanwha is actually leading this, which is all about the laser beam. And they are talking about a dollar... Uh, 0.50 per shot and that's what we are talking about in terms of low cost. Um, UK had already done this some time ago, a pound per shot in terms of lasers and advancement in lasers always also means um, how pure is your laser more than what power you put in the laser. So the purity of laser comes with, um, with advanced um, physics and investment in, in knowledge how do you purify the laser and actually put that beam to drill a hole at, at the point of impact? Um, U.S. Navy fires the laser weapon in Mideast amid uh, the, uh, the, the drone boat threat. Swarm carrier drones, we are talking about um, ship launched, air aircraft launched. Um, do we think about already uh, the, the U.S. Air Force, uh, AFRL has, has given out an RFI and the RFI is in the, in the public domain. It was very interesting to see in the RFI because when I was reading that RFI, how, how beautifully they described as to what they exactly want in the drone. They wanted a drone that could carry a number of uh, swarm drones and this drone could uh, operate by itself. It could be launched from a C-130 um, uh, and, and at, at, the point of, uh, at the point of impact, it just releases a swarm and the swarms are expendable and the drone comes back. So uh, we are talking in terms of um, uh, such, such tactics that, uh, that people are doing. At the Eurosatry, a number of uh, significant advancements have been um, showcased uh, in terms of the um, uh, France and Italy, you know, they, they, they showcase the SAMP TNG air defense system, um, uh, including the Aster 30B1. 
Um, the Kongsberg uh, displayed the, the nomads. Uh, Thales, the Shorad command vehicle, and then the, um, uh, the 10th Army and Air Defense, uh, Air Defense Missile Command um, did the integrated air and missile defense discussions, and there were a number of these uh, to uh, talking points that came out from there. And then Def Sentinel Solutions, an Estonian company, has unveiled its AI-assisted ultra-short air air defense system, Air Shield. So, what role will AI play in the whole concept of uh, air defense, and how quantum technologies will increase the uh, al uh, the, the algorithms which are which are going into the AI and calculate at uh, at, at such speeds that are not known? Because air defense is probably the the one primary aspect in warfare which calls for real time. We don't, I mean, if you believe in near real time, then I think we are not talking air defense. Near real time may be applicable to, uh, to other domains, but when it comes to air, air defense, we are talking about real time and therefore we have to think in terms of uh, quantum, quantum assisted AI and AI assisted uh, battle. So uh, there are a number of uh, players globally on detection and tracking. We all know them, Raytheon to Lockheed Martin to Elbit, IAI, BAE, any number of them. And then there are any number of these radars. And some of them, I just wanted to recall the SPY-7 radar, which is considered one of the most advanced radar. Um, which, uh, you know, the, the, the entire idea of uh, having a, a long-range radar and having, having a family of such radars is to ensure that you have a zero probability of missing. I mean, there's no question of missing a particular target from the time you detect and the time you track it down to, uh, to, to bring it to effect. Um, India has also had this, you know, uh, Astra Mark I, uh, BVDAM, and it's gaining international attention these days as a viable alternative to the, the Russian BVDAMs. And uh, it's compatible on the, on the Sukhois, and also, in comparison with the AIM-120, uh, I think Astra is designed to match their performance. Uh, there are uh, a number of these systems, at least 20 of them have been placed out of the 310 in the positive indigenization list, which varies from um, short-range missiles to uh, multi-barrel launchers to high-power radars to Astra to loitering munitions, and any number of them are there. I'm not recalling all of them. It's all there in the list. You can read them. And then IDEX itself has got more than about 10 programs which have, um, uh, you know, the, the challenges have been launched. Uh, something like the long endurance aerial surveillance platform, smart, smart, smart munitions, alpha. And, you know, we have one of the best uh, challenges um, ecosystem in the world. Today, the IDEX that, uh, that India is, uh, is pushing forward with more than about 400 companies actively participating as we talk and uh, more than about uh, 600 to 800 of them over there in the, in the, in the radar, we are, we are talking in terms of a very, very strong fundamental ecosystem in the country. Uh, TDF has got one program, which is the radar signal processor with active antenna array simulator. Make one has got a couple of them, which is the LR LACM, the long range land attack cruise missile. I think that's going in for a very good toss now because I'm seeing a number of companies like, uh, like Panini and others who have, who have come forward and say, yes, we can do it, including uh, the, the motor, the engine, and uh, you know, the, the complementary programs like Ramjet, which are, which are in the Aditi programs. There are a number of programs in Make 2. Um, uh, it's all there from uh, you know, the integrated air defense combat simulator to missile range, precision kill systems, and, and, and any number of them. A couple of programs also very encouragingly in, uh, seen in Make 3. And uh, there are some major acquisitions that have been planned, like uh, Vishorad IR homing, for which the AON has been uh, given. Air defense fire control radar, also AON has been given. Uh, we are talking about the RFP, active RFP on the 220 air defense guns, and the counter US systems, any number of them that are coming through. Uh, the TPCR 2018, although a little old, but it also talks about some of these anti-RPA defense systems, RF inhibition, and uh, high energy laser system, etc. So that begs the question, what are the challenges that we are, we are looking at in, when we talk about air and missile defense? We are talking about what the um, Israeli missile chief said. You know, what we are talking about as a challenge here is the lack of multi-layered defense. 
and um, uh, we still have to put that something like a NISAM, we got to put that uh, in order and have this multi-layered system effectively placed and, and, and develop the other two layers. We have just been able to develop one layer out of the, out of the, out of the, uh, the multi-layered systems. Integration of systems, we have to talk here about uh, network-centric warfare. Again, once again, we go back to quantum systems, we go back to algorithms, we go back to high-speed algorithms. The vice chief talked about uh, effective communication as to how it, it should be, how we should, should be able to communicate effectively and to the point, and all this will happen only if the network is uh, essentially robust. Cyber security will uh, automatically be a part of, uh, will be very integral to the whole thing because we, we are talking about a networked system. Interoperability is always, uh, always an issue like today we, from, you know, if we talk from outer space and uh, we talk about the satellite communication, talk about the defense in outer space because um, Air Force has the mandate today to take care of anything that is uh, space and outer space. And therefore, we, we, we need to integrate the complete defense of outer space, defense of airspace, um, and, uh, and then um, the low airspace, including helicopters and, uh, and all the others that, that, that fly around us. Surveillance and detection, and it's, it is the fundamental aspect of uh, complete air defense, and therefore ISR along with detection and detection technologies, detectors, diodes, uh, we talked about, we have to think in terms about the technologies that go into these and the chips that could uh, increase their speed and the materials. One of the fundamental factors we are lacking as a country is strategic materials. Ladies and gentlemen, we are highly dependent on strategic materials in this country and uh, on an average every year, we are importing close to 30,000 crores worth of strategic materials that go into our, our defense systems. And uh, if I were to put a CIGR on that and move it five years hence, um, it's, it's a phenomenal number. And this number was close to about 22,000 crores in the year 21 or 22, when I was part of the task force to uh, also assess as to what type of strategic materials may be required. You'll be very happy to know that uh, as we talk, um, we are going to very soon come out with a PLI, a product-linked uh, uh, incentive scheme for strategic materials in the country. And uh, I'm very proud and happy to say that Ernst & Young and my team has been working with the Ministry of Defense, with the Defense Secretary in putting this through. And as I, as I know something about it, that uh, we, are, we, are, we are going to see it coming out very quickly now. A number of technologies are available in terms of directed energy weapons in terms, because at the end of the day, um, the, uh, the type of uh, engagement that we are going to see will not necessarily restrain to, you know, at a particular domain. The Vice Chief talked about it, A. Marshal Gulani talked about it. It's going to be a multi-domain multi um, uh, operations and therefore we have to talk in terms of advanced radars, integrated systems, hypersonic defense and things like that. Before I conclude, I wanted to tell you that we did a very extensive analysis on um, the type of technologies that uh, may be required for us to invest as we go forward. And uh, in looking at these technologies and trying to uh, sort of uh, analyze them, because when you start reading, one is to read and say, this is the technology that you want. The second is also make a little analysis and say what, what really went right and what really went wrong. And um, I do not know whether it's right or wrong, but I'll, I'll give you three approaches that we have taken as a nation till now. One is what is called as a top-down approach. This top-down approach was a project-driven based on initiation of certain program. The second is a bottoms-up approach, which is research-driven, in which the outcome of the research is combined to develop a product. The third is indigenization, which is strategy-driven. Top-down approach, approach, some of the... Um, the projects that came up were the MAIL, the medium altitude, long endurance UAV, the high altitude HAIL, um, high speed UAV, subsonic cruise missiles, and high speed expend expendable targets. In the bottoms up, some of the things that came up were the unmanned strike aircraft, the swarm drones for surveillance and seed mission, um, supersonic UCAVs, optionally piloted UCAV, high altitude, long endurance UCAVs, uh, long-range, long-endurance, loitering munitions, air-launched UAVs, cargo delivery UAVs, uh, collaborative combat unmanned programs. So, 
I am not going into the details of uh, the program, the, the technologies, because there are more than about, I think, 60, 70 of them that we have identified to be crucial, that we need to invest as we go forward in the next about five years. But I can tell you, um, as at a glance, if I may, if I may say, um, in terms of aeromechanical and propulsion, it will be active flow technologies, configuration design, structural health, next generation, aluminum alloys, turbofan engines, turboprop engines, digital twin technology. Digital twin is another very, very important aspect that we need to invest. There are, there are a couple of startups that have started investing in this, and I think we need to take them forward, handhold them and take them forward on multidisciplinary optimization. Flight controls, navigation guidance, um, control guidance, AI-based control law design, it's all going to be AI-based when it comes to, um, comes to guidance and navigation because the, as you see, the, as, as you know, when the pilot is there with his, with his aircraft or the UAV is there flying out there, you do not know as to when it uh, moves up and down and what, what it would see or what it would not see and therefore it has to be an AI-powered application with Logarithm, algorithmic, algorithmic learning and warfare, which is to guide this, uh, this particular aircraft or this, uh, this, uh, this craft which is in the air. Anti-jam modules for GNSS, anti-spoofing. And here again, I have a small uh, observation. The moment you create a spoof, there is somebody who creates an anti-spoof. The moment you, you, you say, okay, I will jam on this, then there is an anti-jamming. And, and therefore, this is going to be a battle that is going to be fought in the electronic warfare domain. While that battle can be fought and while we will do what we can in that, um, one of the lessons that has been learned from the wars is that can we create cheap bombs and keep throwing at them which are jam resistant, I mean they just go, it's pure kinetic energy and can we use them to, uh, to achieve the results that we need. Avionics, data links, simulators, software defined radios, frequency selective, frequency selective surfaces, uh, cords adaptation by ruggedization, um, long range lasers, optical wireless. I'm just uh, you know, reading one of the 20 which comes. And then I'm going to talk about priority technology areas for UCAVs. Uh, we're going to, we, I think we need to invest in intelligent autonomy, network connectivity, airspace management, and weaponization. Stealth technologies in terms of designs, uh, materials, noise suppressors, plasma, etc. Immersive technologies, once again, come back to the digital twin, the mixed reality, um, which is uh, a mix of VR and AR, uh, which, um, uh, you know, it actually, experience can be achieved using various technologies such as sensors, cameras, and advanced graphics, and uh, to prove a real-time uh, real um, uh, view. And then the morphing wing. The wing itself, you know, we have to think in terms of design and uh, implementation of morphing wings, which primarily changes the geometric shape of the wing during the flight, and therefore you create multi-mission um, multi uh, aircrafts. Bay door mechanisms, adaptive wing technologies, and all those will go into that. There are some manufacturing technologies we need to invest when I see the TRL levels versus the MRL levels. We are not matching. Where the TRL is high, the MRL is low. Where the MRL is high, the TRL is low. And therefore, we need to bring up the TRL and MRL together as and when we develop an indigenous technology. I think the industry has to invest in those, in those um, machinery and the ML, AI ML techniques to bring up the uh, MRL level to those, those stages. Otherwise, the services will never get what they really want and they will have to suffer with what we give them. And therefore, and therefore, let us uh, be very prudent to ourselves as an industry and say, okay, this is what I'm going to, uh, to invest. So just for recommendations, we need to enhance uh, indigenous capabilities. Like the Vice Chief said, technology collaboration will be one of the ways. Uh, integrated uh, defense network, we need to really work uh, closely in terms of a network-centric uh, network warfare uh, programs. And uh, we have to close the asymmetry gap that I talked about some time back. Um, there is a roadmap, short term, uh, long term, that is there. I mean, it will be there in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, the report that we release. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I should say, uh, it is again with pride. Uh, we say today that uh, Air Force has deployed the summer system in Ladakh. Um, within six months of its induction into the Air Force, it's a proud moment for India. And it's a moment where uh, we relish the, the entire uh, concept of public-private partnership uh, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's these BRDs which have actually come forward and uh, the scholar and the warriors 
have brought about such an effective system that's today deployed and which is very, very effective and potent against all possible aerial threats. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir, for giving an industry perspective. Before I request Air Vice Marshal I.S. Walia, AVSM, VM, AD Commander, Headquart Headquarters, Western Air Command, to give the special address a brief about, sir. AVM, I.S. Walia, was commissioned in the flying branch of the Indian Air Force in 1988. He did the fighter strike leader course and was posted as directing staff in TACTI. He commanded a MiG-27 ML squadron. He attended the staff course at UK in 2002. Later, he was posted as defense advisor in the Embassy of India in Japan. Over to you, sir. Air Chief Marshal Tyagi, Air Chief Marshal Bhaduria, Air Marshal A.P. Singh, the Vice Chief of the Air Staff, Air Marshal Gulani, Director General of the Center of Air Pass Studies, General Ravi Arora, Chief Editor of the Indian Military Review, Senior Officers, Eminent Scholars, Scientists, Students, and Practitioners of the Business of Aerial Warfare. I myself am a practitioner of this business at the moment, and like the Vice Chief here, most of my working hours are spent dealing with the implications, capabilities, and possibilities of all that is captured in the topic of the seminar today. Therefore, I will put forward a number of thoughts in no particular sequence, but loosely connected with this topic from a user's perspective. I will present to you some nuances of many things that I hear and read about, and I would like to clarify them to set the uh, template within which we can discuss this seminar. And in keeping with the academic nature of this seminar, uh, these are also my views alone and not that of the Air Force. To start with, I would like to explain the business of air defense. I know it sounds strange to an audience like this, but the reason why I want to expound on this issue is that despite the fact that everyone seems to be familiar with what air defense is, I feel that that term is actually a very bit limiting. In reality, it is the conduct of air operations business of the Indian Air Force in peacetime, and I wish to emphasize that fact. The magnitude and the mandate of the Air Force task, which comes under the ambit of this term, it encompasses all air, pro air operations in peacetime. And it includes everything, except, I would suggest, training and some parts of air maintenance. Otherwise, what we consider air defense is the business of the Indian Air Force that is being done today, other than the training activities, whether it's uh, pilots training in combat squadrons or in the Air Force Academy. Rest everything falls under this term. And as a matter of routine, every aircraft in the sky, whether it's Indigo or Etihad, any charter plane, flying club, from the Army, Navy, Air Force, BSF, in the tactical battle area, or over the coast, or from any other agency, is identified, monitored, controlled, communicated with, and managed continuously. There are radars churning and rotating, controllers watching and controlling, people identifying, armed aircraft on ORP, and SAM systems on alert continuously all over the country, round the clock, every minute of the year. What I want to say is this activity is on continuously all the time. Now, what happens during outbreak of hostilities or during actual operations? The only difference is that everything that I've just said continues to happen and has to continue with the inclusion of aircraft that are going to go across the border and deliver weapons. So, they are subject to exactly the same processes that are going on at this time. Obviously, it's going to be much more intense. It also cannot be compartmentalized or you know, differentiated, like that of a holding or a pivot core and that of a strike core. They are not different activities. So the activities in the realm of air are all encom encompassing. They're amorphous in nature. And therefore, the business would probably be better described as air operations during peace. In war, they just simply become air operations. And as aircraft and systems swing between roles and activities, the words, the nomenclature, and the labels at this stage are not important and, of course, can be refined and debated. And therefore, I submit to all of you that the word air defense seems to be an inadequate description of the scope and magnitude of the activities that it entails. 
I therefore strongly recommend that the audience ab absorbs this aspect so that one understands the framework within which to imply the concepts which will be discussed later throughout the day. Next, I would like to clarify on one another part of the conduct of these air operations in today's environment. Earlier, the ranges of our sensors and that of our SAM weapons and of aircraft were very limited. So the entire area could not be covered and it would have required a large number of resources. We were not networked and therefore a lot of operational procedures were devised which depended upon coordination and communication. So we could only defend points and therefore those terms like vital areas and vital points came into being and therefore we needed to have a large number of SOPs, directives, joint procedures for interzone coordination and words like CRCs, ADDCs, TBAs, etc. So as a result, we had a huge number of documents and we needed to spell out how things would be done in every possible conceivable situation. So we relied on procedural controls in the TBA, that is the tactical battle area, in the JADC, in airspace management, weapon handling, controlling, etc. We had to demarcate these areas so that procedural responsibilities could be fixed and we could react appropriately within the limitations of what we called point defense. Right. Today, we no longer do point defense. We defend the entire area. And this has been possible with the amazing technical development, which is a combination of the development of the ISCCS and the AFNET. We have been able to network sensors of all types and origins, which provides us with a composite air picture. This permits the Air Force today to exert control over an area without resorting to procedural methods of what we did earlier. In fact, just about last week, we have sort of, uh, you know, carried out trial, full-scale trials and the operationalized of the Akyashtir, which is the Indian Army version of the ICSCS, is an operation. And with that, I visualize that the concept of procedural frameworks like that of the tactical battle area, airspace management, the JADC itself become redundant. So that is the point that I'm trying to make. Because whatever is picked up on any sensor, irrespective of the owner, whether it's the Army, Navy, Air Force, BSF or whatever, will be available on the recognized air situation picture which is available at the ISCCS. Thereafter, the nodes would carry out the engagement of the threat using the most appropriate weapon, which in this case could be an interceptor fighter aircraft in the air armed with air-to-air -air missiles, an Indian Army MRSAM or even an Indian Army IGLA, whichever is located close by. The most appropriate weapon for the job Ownership of the weapon is irrelevant at this place, and control would be exercised by the nodes. Now, the airspace is also very crowded and is being used by a large number of users. And earlier, because of the limitations that I mentioned earlier, there would be corridor reserved and procedural aspects to manage this airspace was carried out and demarcated by a number of agencies. It was the only possible method then. Today, however, the ranges are much larger. For example, the Army MRSAM has a range of 70 kilometers. The Sudarshan has a range in excess of 200 plus kilometers. So reservation is not possible, nor desirable. All those procedures were instituted because we could not do any better then. It is an inefficient method. And now that we have a global picture, these procedures become irrelevant and the nodes can manage the environment with great flexibility. The last two points that I've made, I mentioned these aspects because I wish to submit to the House that many of the discussions that take place in the academia, in the professional academia, have their origins in these assumptions. And I submit to you that these assumptions itself are outdated, which makes the viewpoints itself irrelevant. Very often there are uh, viewpoints on the cost effectiveness of SAMs versus that of aircraft. I would again suggest that both are equally important and need to be employed in conjunction. To give you a very simplistic example, an Akash missile system has an on-duty crew of about 40 to 50 ops and technical crew and has a, covers a radius, of about, a radius area of about 20 kilometers. If I have to keep 24-7 watch in three shifts over a thousand kilometer frontage, the number of units would be really, really very large and I would need to employ many of them. So whereas a single aircraft on ORP could cover a large area and be sent anywhere very quickly and flexibly. The point here is, it's that every type of weapon has its advantages and disadvantages. It is a very poor argument when one bases it on a singular factor. 
What we need to do is to manage the environment such that it works at its most efficient by ensuring the shortcomings of one system or one form of force are overcome by the use of another form. That is tactical prudence and that's the job of the tactical commander. Ballistic missile defense is also an important aspect that needs to be included in our future calculations, planning and equipping for air operations. The airspace is a continuum and the decision cycle to engage threats emanating from a vehicle that uses the medium of space or air are exactly the same and similar. The means of detection and response need a little change and they need to be integrated and practiced. The principles are, are the same and therefore the House needs to remember, just for emphasis, that it's like the Navy managing the surface ships and the underwater uh, submarine force. It's similar to that aspect and we need to understand that it is one continuous continuum. And just as an aside, a ballistic missile is fundamentally a 250 or a 500 kg bomb and very, very expensive. And in comparison, a Su-30 could carry 12 to 18 of them and uh, deliver them where you need it. Right. The types of threat that will transit through the air are aircraft of all types, standoff weapons of increasing ranges, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and now drones. But just to put things in perspective, there have been technological advancements at every turn of the century and turn of events and continuously through history. Fire arrows came to be used in around the 10th century in China and Korea and later on in 14th century Europe. Fire did rain down from the skies. Throwing machines or catapults or what you call the trebuchet, which had the ability to launch a projectile was employed in the 14th century or even earlier depending on what history you read. Fortifications developed Tactics developed, the Roman army had the tortoise or the tetsudo in the phalanx, which shielded them from the top and the side. So what I want to say is that human ingenuity knows no bounds, and in our business, especially that of air power, it will continue to be a constant process of measures and countermeasures. So what I would like to emphasize to you, that all these kinds of threats have existed in some form or the other in this century and are not strange to us. Drones, unmanned systems have existed in our Air Force. We have them as loiter munitions and the type and have been in our inventory. I would also like to draw a distinction in the matter of these drones. In the present conventional understanding, it is the quadcopter type or those other drones that have captured the public imagination. I must tell you that these have very limited range with very limited payloads and have guidance limitations. Drones launched in Delhi, national capital region, from inside our borders, need to be tackled differently than those drones or light munitions which come to us from across the border. The first type, I would suggest, is essentially a policing function and has to be dealt with through regulation, control, and policing. Defense against such kind of drones, whether from across the border or inside, could come from complex electronic warfare systems or by using a simple fishing mesh net. Today we grapple with counter US systems, which we have, and they bring a different types of number of challenges to the environment. There is no perfect solution or the one best method or equipment or one force in this business. One can never be perfectly prepared. One can only study, prepare, equip, and when the time comes to be able to combine ingenuity, experience, and the ability to evaluate the environment and all relevant factors. This is where the human mind of the commander with his ability to cut across a million options using his experience and ability will come into play. Today's seminar is also about strategies, about the way forward. We have two very determined adversaries who are very well prepared and well equipped. So our essence of our strategy is to ensure a credible air and missile defense. To achieve this, we need to detect these, most importantly, identify these and then engage through a variety of means depending on the intruding platform. Identification remains the key and is the key to enter any kind of air operations and is the function that is the job of the Indian Air Force. The nodes today have become the centers where decision making takes place and the most appropriate weapon like I covered earlier, irrespective of the owner, whether it's Air Force, Army, BSF, Navy, is used to engage the threat. Today we are also at a point of inflection the conventional assessments on the durations, types of war, perceived sensitivities, casualties, alignments have all been turned on their head. The conflicts in Hamas-Israel, 
Russia and Ukraine have shown that whatever academic notions and assumptions which we considered established do not hold true anymore. So we are faced with a number of questions. Are any of our assumptions regarding the nature of future war or present war correct? Is the information that I get correct? I would suggest that we don't really believe everything that we read or are given to us. Will the attacks come to us from new or unforeseen dimensions, method or stranger platforms? And specifically for me, will my equipment work as promised and advertised? So the IF combat aircraft strength is at the lowest at the moment. The demands are very high. And we are at a turning point in acquisition plans with a huge impetus being given to indigenous development. To prevail in tomorrow's conflict, we have to think and plan ahead. We need to stay ahead, as has been covered by the speakers earlier. And we need to be adaptive and responsive. What is it that we seek from the energy? We do understand that today technology has a very short life. This cycle does not synchronize easily with our procurement processes. The meshing and intermingling of doctrine, its impetus to the development of technology and vice versa, is played out in an everlasting cycle of catch-up. So what we need is, and here I'm going to be really very down in the weeds, is we need equipment to be able to operate in an environment where we need to fight. Nobody else in the world, except our two adversaries, operate at those altitudes, temperatures, and environment. So we need equipment that will work there. We need quality. We need equipment that is robust in deployment and robust in handling. We need equipment that is simple to operate. We need equipment that is small, compact, and reliable. We need equipment that is easy to sustain and maintain. It cannot have a million parts that are not available to us, and it's not available where we need it, and there is nothing after sales of that equipment. We need equipment that does not have frills. We need equipment that is cost-effective, because if the target is cost or is uh, tactically only so expensive to send a ballistic missile which costs thousands of crores of rupees would not be a really cost-effective measure, even if it was possible. And technology must meet its promises. Very often it disappoints, so we need to be careful. I know that the industry seeks easier procedures, and towards that, there are a number of schemes, of which there are experts here who will tell you more about it, that encourage participation and making it profitable to you. My recommendation would be to involve the user and have the experts in the field available to you in the design process so that the product that is available to the environment is what we need. The business of air warfare is very complex. Air power is the first responder and can shape and impact the environment of all kinds, air, sea, land, the media, and any other dimension, very dramatically. It is also the most dependent on technology and therefore needs to keep pace. These are interesting times. It's been a privilege to address this August gathering on the topic of Air and Missile Defense India. I hope I've given you some thoughts to think about and ponder. I wish you the very best in today's proceedings. Thank you very much. May I request all the guests to kindly release the knowledge paper. Thank you to all the guests for doing the honours. The knowledge paper is being sent to all the delegates on their registered mobile number. Later it will be sent by email also to all the delegates. <laughs>